the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Lord, forgive us as we, to the best of our ability, forgive others. Amen. Please be seated. Had I been aware of the second reading, which is the poem, um, I might have approached things a little bit differently this morning. But I was basing my thoughts for today on a couple of experiences I've had recently, a, um, a conversation I had with my granddaughter who has just begun her freshman year at, in um, American University where she has a double major of environmental studies and some kind of esoteric science that I have no way of understanding. <laughs> but two thoughts or perhaps challenges for us came up for me as I was thinking about Mark's gospel last week. Thomas Akempis, a Christian theologian, wrote, and I quote, Jesus has many lovers of his heavenly kingdom, but few bearers of his cross. And the other was in conversation with a woman who some of you may know. Her name is Susan Hartney. She's the wife of Father Michael Hartney. She is a, was, she's now a retired professional sing, singer. She was talking about Eleanor Seal Whitney, who I had never heard of, who was an opera singer. And one of the things, memorable quotes from this woman is, Christians are like tea bags. You never know what kind you are until you're in hot water. <laughs> and um, particularly with all that is out there in the world and in the social media, and I'm not going there, but that, that comment um, earlier this week from a friend really struck me. Um, I feel as if we're all in hot water right now. Recently, I supplied at a church when the acolyte didn't show up. The mother of a little boy who was kind of bouncing up and down offered her son to fill in. I thought, oh, okay, what's going to happen next? I was told he was always very enthusiastic about bringing up the authoring with the ushers, that he wanted to carry the cross, but he wasn't big enough to hold it up. But the wardens encouraged me to agree to let him be my acolyte. So I said, sure, OK. He listened very careful to me when I was telling him what I wanted him to do. And he did everything I asked him to. He asked if he could stand beside me, which was fine, although no one could see his head above the altar because he is so short. <laughs> As he was holding the gospel book for me, his mother noticed he was holding it on an angle and down low that made it really difficult for me to try and read it. She came up quietly behind him and helped him just lift up the book a little bit to be higher. Now realize, I was trying to read the gospel from a height somewhere down around my knees. <laughs> <laughs> but after this gentle assist from his mother, the little boy kept holding the book right where I could read it, nice and steady. Reflecting on what happened seamlessly at that gospel reading was that the boy's mom did not take the book away from him to hold it at the normal height. She didn't scold him. She simply helped her young son a tiny bit without disempowering him and his ministry that day. How often do we empower someone who otherwise may, might have been embarrassed or dismayed or made to, made to feel a little bit less than human. How many of us respond the way that mother did? Let's think about the example of both this mother and the young boy. God does things like that for us all the time if we stop to think about it. God doesn't usually chastise us for doing something that may not be quite perfect. I know I'm a long way from perfect. 
God understands us and our feelings, and God dearly loves us as a mother loves and encourages her young children, even when we question, reject, or argue. And now for the conversation from my granddaughter. The physicist Stephen Hawkins said he couldn't find a way to believe in God. Professor Hawk Hawkins perhaps was the most brilliant mind of the 21st century, yet he couldn't discover God by mathematical equations or by observing the laws of the universe. But I saw an insightful presentation, this is what my granddaughter was telling me, of Hawkins, which helps explain why there are some holes in some galaxies and why the universe seems so chaotic at times. He did an experiment where many ball bearings were rolled into the floor of a room where he was sitting in his wheelchair, speaking with his computer-generated voice. The video showed the ball bearings roll onto this floor and because of the equal amounts of gravity between each ball, they seemed miraculously to arrange themselves very neatly into rows and columns. This neat arrangement, Professor Hawkins said, was demonstrating how gravity tends to bring, move everything in regular patterns. But the observable universe is not so neatly arranged it's quite disorganized, not at all what a physicist would have expected. And Stephen began to explain a higher reason for why there is such fundamental disorder in our universe. In his experiment, he takes five ball bearings from the floor. And what happens? The rest of the balls begin to roll around as they try to equalize the gravity of the remaining balls. And the whole floor becomes chaotic just the way if we pull something out, everything can tip one way or another. We've all had those experiences. Sometimes it's just that, um, uh-oh, I forgot my credit card and I need gas and I don't have any way of getting it. Whatever it may be, all of a sudden we have chaos. Professor Hawkins explained that what happens in an even more fundamental law of the universe than gravity is the law of imperfection. Nothing in our universe is ever perfect. And we all have to remind, remember that we are never perfect, and it's okay. Planets arrange themselves around their suns in a more or less orderly fashion, but their courses are not exactly predictable from the laws of gravity. The law of imperfection means that nothing in the universe behaves perfectly, is arranged perfectly, or can be predicted perfectly. Wouldn't it be nice if that were not so? And we could just say, okay, it's going to be this and this and this, and everything will be fine. And forget about everything we hear and read. This fundamental nature of our universe is as true of we human beings as it is of suns and planets. None of us is perfect. None of us is completely whole. And that is what we see today in our gospel lesson about Peter, Jesus' beloved apostle. Peter often tried his best, but his best was never perfect, nor would he ever be perfect. But Jesus accepted him just the way he was, warts and all, impulsive and daring, caring yet unconcerned about the future of the faith. And Peter failed miserably when it came to the spiritual truths. Peter's idea of the Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ, was someone more like the son of David. David, the great general and eventual leader of all the tribes and peoples of Israel. But David expressed his leadership in killing people. David slaughtered thousands, including innocents. David would let nothing stand in his way. But occasionally he sought God's face, and God corrected him and set David back on a preferred course. David always strayed from God. And here's the thing. God had to keep calling David back. God always calls us back 
We just have to be willing to listen, to hear. The Apostle Peter was similar to David. He was caring but uncaring, loving yet unloving, sinful to the core, very much like King David. But Christ saw in Peter possibility. Jesus saw in this fisherman some potential, some promise, some hope. And Jesus took imperfect Peter under his wing, trying over and over again to instruct him, to coach him, to teach him. But hard-headed Peter would not listen, and he would not learn. I know there are lots of times in my life when I haven't listened and wasn't wanting to learn. All those years Peter sat in the shadow of Jesus, and yet Peter still did not get it. Aren't we a bit that way ourselves sometimes? Sometimes we just don't get it. So often we prefer power over persuasion, bending rules over obeying God's rules, testing God's mercy and love, instead of basking in God's ever-caring and forgiving arms. That's just such a, a wonderful image for me. I just think, oh, in our world today, and narrow it down from the world to our country, to our nation. Imagine if we could all love and give mercy and bask in God's ever-caring, forgiving arms, no matter what our beliefs, no matter what our policies or other things in our lives. But Peter wanted a Davidic leader, a political guru, instead of a mentor. Peter was as blinded by Satan as any other person, including Jesus. And Peter failed over and over again. Yet, Jesus always gave Peter the benefit of the doubt, and Jesus kept trying to mold Peter into a better person, and we know eventually into an amazing apostle. But Peter was kind of a pain. Jesus hurled the biggest insult against any person possible by calling Peter Satan, the most evil of them all. Yet Jesus always used words. Jesus never struck Peter physically. Jesus never had Peter arrested. Jesus never held Peter down until Peter cried for mercy. Jesus kept molding him, kept teaching Peter, kept mentoring Peter. Incredible patience of our Lord. And even though Peter betrayed Jesus at the end of his, by his denials that Peter even knew Jesus, Peter was, as are we, forgiven. We are forgiven. We have to remember that. Jesus surely knew the universe and all in it are imperfect. And Jesus kept on trusting and loving all the humans he had made with his own hands of creation. The universe is and always will be imperfect. But Jesus wanted Peter to know that even the sinful and imperfect nature of people would not stop his redemption of the humanity who believe in him. Jesus would go to the cross knowing full well that we humans would always sin and be imperfect in everything we do or attempt to do. But that fact of our sinful nature never kept Jesus from loving us and trying to bring us back into the grace of his Father, God, his heavenly parent. And day by day, God keeps molding us and mending us and mentoring us until we are as perfect as we will ever be as Christ's disciples on earth. Winning the lost, caring for the least, comforting the downtrodden, loving, at least attempting to love, every one of God's human creation, good or bad. 
And I know from my personal experience over the years that the people gathered here this morning and the people of St. Mark's really work at that. And you do a good job, in my humble opinion. Jesus always pulls us back from the clutches of sin and death, using us in miraculous ways if we will only cooperate with God. And through us, God is bringing the perfect kingdom of God slowly but surely into our sin-sick world. Thanks be to God who never gives up on us just as Jesus never gave up on Peter. Amen.